Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in this lecture of EC3400 Analog Electronics, we will take a look at push-pull amplifiers built from bipolar junction transistors. And in particular, we'll look at a bias scheme called the VBE multiplier. So push-pull amplifiers try to solve a problem associated with your standard boring single transistor common collector amplifier. So these are also known as emitter followers because they're very good voltage buffers, particularly because they have a very low output impedance. Now, a potential problem with these amplifiers is that they're not very efficient. Even when you're not putting any signal into your amplifier, you are always dealing with this bias current here that is causing heat to be produced in this resistor. And there's also potentially heat being dissipated by your transistor. And for a small signal circuit, that might not be too much of a problem. But in a power amplifier, just having this thing biased means you're wasting energy when you're not even using it. So basically, the push-pull output stage has two common collector amplifiers essentially in parallel. One of them uses an NPN transistor, and one of them uses a PNP transistor. And remember, the complementary version of an amplifier basically flips everything upside down. Now, the other thing you'll notice here is we don't have all of this complicated biasing network in front here. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take our input signal and jam it right into the bases of each of the amplifiers. So I've written this here using a little v and a capital I indicating the total signal. Similarly, at the output, I've written little v capital O to indicate the total signal. But I could just as well make this a lowercase o and a lowercase i since essentially the DC version of the input and the output is just zero. So capital V, capital I is zero, and capital V, capital O is zero. Also notice that we're taking the output here instead of directly at the emitters. All right, so I'm going to assume that the emitter resistors here are a lot smaller than the actual load resistance. So we don't really need to worry about a loss of voltage associated with this load resistance. And basically, either Q1 is going to be active at a given moment, or Q2 is going to be active at a given moment. And when one of them is active, the other one is going to be off. This is called class B operation. But this results in a problem. Imagine that VI starts to go a little positive. Well, you don't actually really get much of an output right away. The voltage needs to rise to a point that it can overcome the turn-on voltage of the base emitter junction of Q1. And until it gets enough voltage, you're not really going to be getting a lot of current out. Similarly, for VI going negative, it needs to go negative enough to get to the point where it's turning on Q2 to overcome its turn on voltage. So it's going to be a little slow getting started going that direction as well. So essentially there's this dead band zone in the middle and that can lead to a horrible kind of distortion called crossover distortion. We really want this input output relationship to be a straight line like B, but we're getting something more like this curve A. So if I were to imagine putting in a sinusoid, an ideally operating amplifier would give us this nice sinusoid out as indicated by waveform B here. But the crossover distortion means that for the small values going in, either slightly positive or slightly negative, you don't get anything out. And this sounds really, really horrible. And this is very different than the kind of flat topping, saturating distortion you can get if you push an amplifier too hard. Here, if you put in a very strong signal, the crossover distortion may not be too noticeable. But as you crank down the volume going in, the crossover distortion is going to start to become a lot more noticeable. And if you crank down the volume enough, you don't get anything out at all. It's a really nasty kind of distortion. So what we would like to do is to bias the base of Q1 up a bit 
to overcome that turn on voltage for Q1 and bias the base of Q2 down a bit to overcome that turn on voltage for Q2. So one thing you might think to do is to add a couple of batteries here. And as we increase VB, you can basically decrease the size of this crossover distortion region here. But there is a point of diminishing returns. Once you get this nice straight line here indicated by B, any further increase of VB is just going to result in wasted power in the bias current that flows through the resistor and the transistors. So you want to crank VB just enough so that you eliminate the crossover distortion, but you don't want to push it any further. This scheme is referred to as a class AB amplifier. And in this particular scheme, both transistors are always on just a little bit, but the bias current isn't that much. So it's still not as inefficient as a full class A amplifier, which is like that initial one transistor amplifier I showed you. Okay, now let's get real. Nobody wants to use a couple of batteries just for biasing the circuit. So we need to use some more complicated electronics here to get the same kind of effect. And one of the simplest solutions to this problem is to use something called a VBE multiplier. And there are much more complicated solutions to this. And in particular, you'll see people use all sorts of crazy tricks on integrated circuits. But this is a good introduction to the topic and is something that is used in audio power amplifiers. So instead of two batteries, I'm going to form a voltage between the bases by the collector to emitter voltage of a new transistor, Q3. And we're going to pick VCE3 by choosing R1 and R2. Now notice I'm being fairly vague as to what's happening in the rest of the circuit out here. I'm going to focus on the biasing here. So I'm going to imagine that there's some current capital I, capital A flowing this direction and similarly down here. And in the analysis I'm about to do, I'm going to suppose that we can neglect the currents flowing through the bases here. Now, usually what they'll do is they'll take the actual signal and they'll inject it as a current either up here or down here, or sometimes they'll inject it in both places where they'll source it on one side and sync it on the other. I'm not going to worry about the details of that here. Usually this DC bias current is provided by a current source on either the top or the bottom. To begin our analysis, notice that the voltage that is dropping across R2, namely I2R2 by Ohm's law, must be equal to the base emitter voltage of Q3. Now, let me also assume that we can neglect the current flowing through the base of Q3, in which case R1 equals R2, so I can write that this equals R1 times R2. So I can divide both sides of the expressions by R2 and get an expression for R1 in terms of VBE3 and R2. That will come in handy in a second. All right, let's bring VCE3 into the picture. So the voltage between here and here is going to equal the voltage drop across R1, which is I1 times R1 according to Ohm's law, plus that VBE3 junction drop again. Okay, so let's take I1 equal VBE3 over R2 and plug it in for I1 here. Then we can say that VCE3 equals this quantity, and I can just factor out VBE3 and say that we can select VCE3 given a particular VBE3 by selecting R1 and R2. Okay, so let's take I1 equal VBE3 over R2 and plug it in for I1 here. Then we can say that VCE3 equals this quantity, and I can just factor out VBE3 and say that we can select VCE3 given a particular VBE3 by selecting R1 and R2. Okay, let's compute the DC bias current for the emitters of Q1 and Q2. So, 
we're going to assume that we want the output current to be zero at the main quiescent operating point. So with that assumption, we can assume that the current flowing through one of the emitters is the same as the current flowing through the other emitter. And we can then write an equation that VCE, the collector to emitter voltage, is the same as the base to emitter voltage of Q1 plus the emitter to base voltage of Q2 plus the voltage drop across this series resistance of 2RE times the emitter current IE. Now, of course, if you're given everything except IE, you can solve this equation and discover IE. But usually what you do in a design process is you decide what IE you want, and then you pick R1 and R2 to get the associated VCE3 that you compute from using that desired IE. For instance, suppose VBE1 and VEB2 are assumed to be 620 millivolts, and we would like a bias current of 1 milliamps for the emitter current. And suppose we've chosen RE to be 100 ohms. Maybe we chose that because we know our load resistance is something like 1 kilo ohm, and we would like RE to be at most 10% of that to avoid getting too much voltage loss. So if we plug all of these quantities into that formula for VCE3 we saw on the previous slide, we wind up with 1.44 volts. And what we will do is we will choose R1 and R2 in order to try to get that 1.44 volts. Now, there are other ways to handle the biasing. A very common trick is to just have a string of diodes along here instead. But then you're sort of stuck choosing between integer multiples of whatever those diode drops are. With the VBE multiplier, you can dial things in a lot more precisely. And in fact, sometimes people will use a potentiometer wired as a variable resistor for R2, or more often it will be some sort of fixed resistor in series with such a variable resistor. And then you can essentially replace the wire here with an ammeter or somewhere else but this will do. And then you can adjust the variable resistor to get the desired current read on the ammeter. Now, you want to make R2 be the thing you vary and not R1. Because notice the R1 in the numerator here. If you tried to use a variable resistor for R1 and that variable resistor fails as an open circuit, then this term essentially blows up. Now, it's not going to blow up to infinity, really. It's going to be limited by whatever your power supplies are, modulo a few base emitter junction kind of voltage drops. But anyway, it's going to be a big voltage that you're suddenly putting across the basis here, which is going to basically max out these transistors and probably burn them out. So you let R2 be the thing that you vary. This is the schematic of one of the versions of a low transient intermodulation distortion amplifier developed by Marshall Leach. The amplifier is often simply called the Leach Amp, and for many decades building such an amplifier was a rite of passage of some electrical engineering students at Georgia Tech. This is a version from 1978. He revised it several times over the years. And if you look here, you'll see a VBE multiplier. It's slightly different than what we talked about because there's some diodes here, but you'll see there's a resistor here and there's a variable resistor here. This is Universal Audio's 1176 limiting amplifier. It's designed to compress the dynamic range of an audio signal. This is the schematic of one of the versions of the 1176. And if you look at the output circuitry, you'll see that the output transformer is driven by a push-pull output stage, but instead of a VBE multiplier, a couple of diodes are used to bias the bases of the transistors in the push-pull output stage to make sure they're operating in a class AB mode. In my guitar amplification and effects class, I take a look at the push-pull power amplifier stages of vacuum tube amplifiers.
There's a complication in building push-pull amplifiers with tubes that you don't have with transistors because with transistors, you have complementary pairs. You have PNPs and NPNs in the case of BJTs, and you have PFETs and NFETs in the case of field effect transistors. But with tubes, you only really have an equivalent of NPNs or NFETs. You don't have an equivalent of PNPs or PFETs. So you need to have something called a phase splitter ahead of your push-pull stage that produces an inverted version of your signal to feed to one of your tubes.